Hey, welcome back to Veteran Revivals. I'm Art, your veteran idiot. This is Earl. Uh, I gotta do some gears on this guy. Gotta get him out on the freeway, be able to drive, keep up with speed. Uh, the freeway, it's just not doing that right now. Got 456s in it, we need to put some 355s, so that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, I just wanna say thank you everybody who went and got my old merchandise, it cleaned house, so thank you, thank you so much for that. I got a lot of questions, uh, I did a short, earlier about how uh, I'm not getting rid of the six, the Roman numeral six, that's here to stay. That was one of the uh, beginning reasons of starting the channel as veteran idiot was to have the six on there, like I got your six. So that's gonna stay in the logo. It's gonna say veteran revivals underneath it. Like I said, it's staying, so don't worry. All right, let's turn this thing around, get it uh, up in the air so we can change out his rear guts. That ain't going nowhere. All right, so now that we're up on the lift, we can get underneath it. And I, you know, really didn't have to lift it up to do this gear change because it's full float and just pull the axles out. And, but I would be kind of folded in half under there trying to do all that work. So got it up in the air so I can at least sit under it and uh, work with all this stuff. So this is going to be the backyard uh, version of a gear job. So I'm just gonna run through the basics of it not really going to get too into depth because there are some much much better examples of how to do gear jobs somewhere on the interwebs uh, but what i'm just going to do is get it to the kind of the basics we're just changing the gears itself not the carrier uh, the bearings are still good so we're going to leave them alone i may have to go get some shims of some sort if it doesn't uh, get the right um, backlash or the the preload when we throw this back in but I'm, i most of the time you can take it out and you can put it back in and it's just kind of fine-tuning uh, stuff to get in there. So what we'll do is we'll start with by uh, opening the cover, draining all the stuff out, and then we can undo the axles and slide them out. You don't have to take the wheels off on this 10 and a quarter. It's a full float, so the axle itself has a bolted flange. You undo the bolts for that, slide the fl flange and axles out, and then you're out of the carrier and the carrier can come out. Uh, I don't have air in this shop yet soon yet so a lot of this is going to be by hand which is going to be kind of tricky when we get to the part with pulling uh, bearings off of the pinion to pull the shim that's out from underneath the the pinion to get our, our proper depth uh, that one's going to be tricky you may have to just cut it off get a new bearing and then press that one on we'll see how it goes we'll see what comes up but um, that's where we're at right now. So let's go ahead and drain this sucker, get that stanky fluid out of there, and then uh, see what we got. All right. So what we're working with here, Ford 10 and a quarter. Uh, I believe the carriers are the same for the 10 and a half, so they, they both bolt up. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But anyways, I'm gonna pull this cover off. They're usually 13s. Sometimes it can be a standard, but 13 millimeters, take all these off and then drain this puppy out. Less of a mess on the uh, axle side if you do this first. And if you're wondering why all the sawdust is still here, for this, I left the sawdust down there for this job. I knew this job was gonna be messy. Gear jobs are always messy, you get it everywhere. So I left some uh, dry sweep down on the floor in preparation. I know, forward thinking. So you just loosen the top one up here, and then we're gonna give this a little whack. That should loosen it up. That's not enough, I'm gonna need a hammer. Oh, they really welded that sucker on there with the RTV. This fluid looks great. Luckily the fan is blowing past me, so I'm not getting completely wafted with this smell. Yeah. Nice. All right, we'll let that drain off the cover for a minute. And then we'll take a look. Okay, this bar is super inconvenient right at eye level here. 
but I popped it into neutral. The pattern looks good, just the wear marks. I haven't thrown any uh, paint on here or anything like that, but the wear mark pattern looks good. There's no gouging, no grooving or anything else like that. Even though we're taking these gears off, it's nice to know uh, what we're looking at. Maybe the uh, depth, pinion depth is way off. Um, typically when they cut these gears, you can reuse the pinion depth and it's just fine, provided it was in a good spot to begin with. So these look good. This, you're probably wondering why there is a tone ring on here. This was out of a uh, 97 F250. So it had the uh, electronic speedometer on it. And so you use the tone ring. That's why this tone ring is on here. It has a little VSS sensor up here. So this did not come in this truck and I'm glad that this was upgraded. These uh, full flow rear ends, they're strong, really, really strong. So it was a good, good upgrade. So let's take a look, see what we can see with the uh, ratio. Let's see if we guessed it correctly. Inconvenient bar is still being inconvenient. I forgot to get brake clean. So that makes things a little more difficult. All right, here we go. All right, so we were a little off on the guess. I just kind of rolled it out to get an idea where it was at. I thought 456 and even using a calculator, it came out to somewhere around 456, but it is not. It is uh, 10 over 41. That gives us four tens. Um, so, I mean, that's all right. Still going to 355 is going to be a decent swap for us. So we'll get some, uh, some good RPM change out of that and be able to cruise much better on the freeway than with these four tens in here. But let's go ahead and mark these bearing caps. They have a J, sideways J over here and then a uh, vertical J over here. Uh, but I like to mark them my own way anyway, so I'll get the punch and we'll put two uh, dots on either side over here and then two vertical dots on either side over here, two horizontal, two vertical on the case. So we'll throw those on there so we get an idea where they're at. These bearing caps also have arrows that point to the outside so you can't really screw it up. You can't take it off, flip it over, put it back in unless you're just not paying attention to it. All right, let's unbolt these axles, slide them out so we can pull this carrier. I've been working on a railroad all the Current shop temperature, if you're wondering, 118. Solid, solid. A giant swamp, swamp cooler just can't keep up with that, no matter what. I'm still a little neck down, so it's not blowing as hard as it could. But that's a lot to keep up with, with a steel and no insulation. Just not going to get ahead of it. But it is blowing on me, so it does feel good. Uh, it's tolerable. A little dizzy when I stand up, but it's tolerable. Come on. Come on. Oh, there we go. Drain all over my tire. All right. You don't have to take it all the way out. I mean, we'll take it out later just to clean it up, but it only needs to come out of the carrier itself. So it's not like a, it's gotta be a crazy distance. And we'll check these wheel bearings, which I mean, they feel, feel good. I'll probably just leave them alone. They look tight, feel tight. All right, let's go to the other side. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's nice. The seal looks pretty good too. May just change it just for funsies. It's having one of these go out. It sucks. Easily fixed, but it sucks. It leaves a big mess. Cool. So carrier is out. You just take those end caps off, put them on the respective sides, and then pop the carrier out. I wasn't too worried about doing checking the backlash in its factory or where it was before because we're putting it back in, and I'm going to set it to a factory backlash anyways, regardless. Uh, so. The shims that are on either side, it had the factory shims, one on each side, and they're cast shims. Be careful with those cast shims. If they drop out, they will break when they hit the ground. So put those on uh, their respective sides and keep them uh, away from each other. I need to get a battery from my micrometer so I can show you exactly how thick they are on either side. And that'll determine our backlash by pushing the carrier one way or another. We need to take out these bolts on the top of the ring gear, drop them out. I didn't put the other ring gear in the freezer. Uh, it's all right. It should s pull on just fine. Now, usually you'll put it in the freezer that way it's nice slide right on and you don't have to suck it up with the bolts. Some people will tell you never suck it up with the bolts. I, I get it. 
you could warp it. There is a chance you could warp it. The amount of times I've warped it in the give or take hundreds of gear jobs that I've done, I haven't warped a gear by doing that because I don't really have access to a freezer in the shop uh, where I'm working. So it should be fine. Got to keep in mind that some of these might be right hand thread. So don't just start cranking on it uh, with an impact. Hit it with a wrench first. Make sure, usually they'll have an R on top, but uh, some of these might be right hand thread and I'm pretty sure it's mostly Mopar. Pretty sure. Correct me in the comments. Nice heavy load of Loctite on those, as there should be. We'll take all these out but two, and then, well, we'll take out all but four. And then we'll tap it down. Give the old tap tap -a -roo. Just tap it in. Is somebody gonna match my freak? There she is. The ring gear is off. That's all there is to it, folks. I'm gonna clean the oil off between. Don't want anything making up space. Doesn't need to be making up space. Contaminants, debris, oil, stuff like that. Need that ring gear to sit flush. We're gonna leave the tone ring on. Wasn't hurting anything before, so we'll just leave it as it is. All right, these gears are from Yukon. Ordered them through Underdog Performance. They gave me a good deal. Brett and Shane over there, good guys, worked them with them for a lot of years. So uh, check them out if you're here in the valley. Uh, they also have an online store. You can check them out, Underdog Performance. Put the website up here. But got these from Yukon. It's pretty much the best in the business for gears. There's Genuine Motive, Superior, stuff like that. There's a bunch of different brands out there, but these are typically um, the top of the, the crop for the gears. Uh, here's part number for you. If you're looking to do this in any of your tenant quarters or whatever swaps you got going on, make sure you check to see if it's a long or short pinion. I looked, looks like a long pinion and given the date of this rear end, it should be a long pinion, but it's not the end of the world if I got to order a yoke, a new yoke for the front. All it is is the difference in length of the, the actual, as far as between the cases, the actual yoke that goes in the front. It's just a longer pinion, longer yoke, helps to decrease some of that, um, play and vibration with the short yoke design. So. <laughs> These do not come with install kits, in case you were wondering. If you plan on swapping out all the bearings and everything else, seals and all that stuff, like you should, you're gonna have to get the install kit, which is, nowadays it's more than the actual gears, which is kind of, kind of strange to me. But, this is our pinion. We'll compare to that to the one so we yank out here in a minute but for right now we're going to throw on this ring gear once we got this up in our face we can initially look for any defects chip teeth scoring any uh stuff on the gears itself we'll clean this all with uh brake heat to clean later but right now we'll just toss it up on there okay we're cleaning the mating surface Man, these bearings look fantastic. Had to have been uh, very, very, very few miles on this rear end. Spider gears look... I wish I had gotten a power tracks for this or a lock right or something, but man, this entire gear job would have been just like $1,500 in parts alone. So that just isn't feasible. I'm trying to do something simple, get us out so we can get some mileage and not really beat up the engine on this uh, power tour. And so gonna have to be gears for now later on we'll pull it out and really you don't have to take this completely apart just slide the axles out to put in the power tracks replace these spider gears so we get limited slip or a lock right which is kind of a spring-loaded locker but I just couldn't couldn't bring myself to buy it right now it's really expensive and all the uh, political text messages are starting to come in really helps us think about what um, is and what can be unburdened by what has been, you know. It's, like I said, it's usually better to freeze these guys, but I think we'll be all right. Pulling air on there. Get the holes lined up and crank it in there. Man, this is a lot easier to do with Dana 44s and 35s where they're like 20 pounds. Holes. 
They're not lining up. And this ring gear's heavy, and I'm standing on my tippy toes. Not ideal. I have a workbench over there. It would be great for this. It's just covered in all kinds of other crap. For real? Come on. So I'm going to put blue Loctite on these. Don't you guys worry. I'm just getting it set up right now so I can cinch it on there. It will get the proper stuff, I promise. These gears have like a sort of a wax coating on them, so we really need to brake clean it pretty well before we start checking backlash and stuff like that. Not at this stage. Just slowly crisp off, pull it up. Not really cranking on it, we're just cinching and that'll slowly pull it around. That way you don't warp it. All right, we'll pull all these out, throw some blue Loctite on them, sink them back down. All right, that's the ring gear and carrier done. Now let's yank that pinion out and start working on that. That's really the difficult part is the pinion. Um, if it's a crush sleeve, we gotta go buy a crush sleeve. Um, if it's just shimmed, that would be beautiful. Uh, as a preload, it'd be relatively close. We shouldn't have to mess with the preload at all with the shim. Um, sometimes it's better to have a crush sleeve so you can just always set the preload no matter what. Sometimes the factory one can be just a little bit tight. These, all these gears are supposed to be very, 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 very close together on their seats and everything else. But sometimes they could just be thousands out and that could mean a loose preload or a very, very, very tight preload. Popped it back in the park so we can loosen this up. What, are, is this another political text? Come on. Got stuff to do. What, it's a 13? I'm not even mad. It's impressive. So while we're down here, I might as well talk about how two thirds of you watching this video right now are not subscribed to this channel. You literally just have to hit a button. That's, that's all you have to do and it helps me out tremendously. Just a button, guys. It was right down there. But anyways, if you could subscribe, that'd be nice. Thank you. Remember folks, don't just yank this out of the transmission. You're gonna have a mess. All right, figure out what this size this nut is. Pull that off, hammer the yoke off this way, and then we'll hammer the pinion out the backside. We're gonna leave the seal intact. We're gonna leave the front bearings intact as well. I saw them when I changed the seal a while ago. They looked beautiful, so beautiful that uh, we're gonna leave them there. So we'll push a pinion out the back and uh, look at cutting that bearing off, pulling the bearing off and finding a replacement for it. But we need that shim underneath that bearing to set our depth. It's actually got pretty decent preload. All right, let's figure out what that bolt is. That nut, these nuts, that one in particular. Oh yeah, first try. That's a winner right there. Earmuffs. She needs a little uh, extra RTV on the splines. She's a gusher. This one might be a short pinion. Maybe ordering up that piece. We can get the rest of it together though. All right, almost looks like it dropped right out of that. May not have to hammer it out the other side, may just fall right out. That's the way it looks, interestingly enough. Oh, enough lollygagging, let's go check it out. All right, so the good and the bad here. Pinion came right out, no issues at all. Sometimes you have to hammer it out the front with an air hammer or whatever. This one just came right out, so that's good. Good there. Um, crush sleeve. Not really what I was hoping for. Uh, it's going to get us the, pre the best preload on rebuild every time. Um, however, sometimes these things can be inherently hard to crush. Like really, really hard to crush. Sometimes you have to lock the pinion in a position and use like a four foot, foot uh, breaker bar to spin it the nut around and crush these sleeves. So we'll get another sleeve 
and we're not going to be able to pull this bearing off. I'm going to have to cut this bearing off, which I kind of figured uh, it's just a giant bearing. So I don't have a puller that can get around that and pull that sucker off. So we'll go ahead and cut it off to get to that shim underneath. Usually you can cut a groove in it and hit it with a chisel and it'll crack the race and then slide off. But you got to take this cage and the needle bearings off or roller bearings, whatever you want to call them. So I'm going to get to work on that. Try not to get any new facial piercings um, and then I'll get right back at you guys and show you what I've come up with. I'll probably have to run to the store to get those bearings and everything else before they close. Yeah, why don't we... No, because I need the number off of this one. And the number's usually on the bottom of the race. We'll cut this off. Be right back. Okay, we're back. Cut the race off. Got the numbers that I need for that bearing. Retrieved the race from underneath. This is a preload. Or, I'm sorry, the depth shim. And this will get us the depth in our pattern. We need to go to the sore. I've got the shim already. Throw that on the new one. We'll clean this up. Don't you worry. Get that new bearing if somebody's got it. Uh, get some paint for the gears. Get a new crush lead and new axle seals. And I think that's about it. And we should just slap the signal. Oh, I need a battery, or a, uh, battery for my caliper. Yeah, need one of those. I'll be right back. You guys enjoy this intermission. Glad to see the straps are still holding up. So, it's time to let all the cats out of the bag and come clean. Turns out, went to go get a bearing for the pinion and it was $130 for just the pinion bearing. So I went on the Amazon and uh, found the cheapest install kit I could find, which happened to be the Motive. Not my first choice, but it does say that it's high quality kits. So it's got to be true. It does have Koyo bearings in it, which are good enough for me. That was what was in it to begin with. Uh, Timken is kind of like, they might as well be gold. But so we got gaskets and everything. So we'll just go ahead and change out all the seals and everything else. Pick this up for about 170. Uh, more than I wanted to spend, but 125 for one bearing, 170 for all the bearings, shims, and seals. Went that route. Now we can get started on this bad dog. And what I mean by that is that I need to go have the bearing pressed on because I don't have a press here. But that's not gonna stop us. That won't take very long. We'll just run down the street to some mechanic shop and have them press it on. NBD. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Oh yeah, there's Reason number 7,225, why buying cheap kits doesn't always get you the best results. It's all right, I was gonna use RTV anyways, but I felt like complaining about the quality immediately. All right. So we're not gonna be changing the actual carrier bearings. The carrier bearings are good. I don't wanna pull them off. I don't wanna mess anything up. They're good, I'm gonna leave them alone. They're the tolerances we want for preload. We know that that preload is going to be good unless we have to change the uh, backlash one direction or the other. We want to keep it the way it is right now. So we'll leave those alone. Another good thing about getting this install kit is it comes with the, uh, the paint. So I don't have to come up with some grease or something like that to make it work. We can just lather this paint on and see our pattern much um, more easily. I think this is how it's the proper English. Those are shims. We'll need those later, hopefully not. This is our fella. HM807044. HM807044. That's a win. All right, let's go get this sucker pressed on. Also, it comes with a new crush sleeve, so I don't have to source that out. Unfortunately, these ones with this little dimple here tend to be a little harder to crush. Hopefully not, but we'll figure something out if it is. I'll actually mic these. Oh, there's there's actually a pretty substantial difference between the two if it'll zoom in and show. So we've got to crush quite a ways. Um, so we'll use the new one. We won't even bother trying to mic the two. All right, this time 
I'll be back and it won't be another day, I promise. Be right back. I'm gonna need this. And I'm back. So I drove all over the place. Every shop I could find between here and Hades. And uh, the only guy that would help me out is Bennett's Auto Repair. So thank you to them. Give them a call if you're in the area. This guy helped me out. I uh, got the bearing pressed on here. These suckers are hard to get on. Mostly, that's why most of the shops turn me down. But now that we got it pressed on here, we'll get under there. I got a new pinion seal, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull the pinion seal off, replace the races in the front of the differential for the pinion, and then we'll be able to slap it back in. And that's pretty much the installation of the gears other than messing with uh, the shims on either side for the backlash. But we'll go ahead and knock out the old races and put in the new races and the gasket, or uh, the seal. And then we will crush sleeve this bad boy on. Hopefully it's not too hard. Uh, if anything, we'll probably heat it up a little bit and then try and quickly ram it in there and get us a, uh, a good preload. Now, the way you're supposed to do with the preload is you're supposed to be able to check deflection and that gives you the proper preload. Uh, I don't have the means to do that, so I usually do it by feel. And if I can give the pinion a spin and it only goes like half turn or three quarter turn and stops and there's obvious, no obvious play, then I go with it. But that's the backyard in a garage, not the right tools way to do it. So I'm just telling you, if you see the video and you see what I'm doing, that's what's happening. It's not the right way by the book, but it works for me and has worked for me many, many times. But don't do it that way. Okay, I think I covered all the legals on that one yeah so don't blame me if you do the hand spinning method and it doesn't work for you So much fun. If it looks like I got in a fight, it's because I did. Fighting that crush sleeve down there. Pinion is in. We're good to go. Had to break out the uh, look out man bar and uh, crank it down. But we finally got it down. It's tightened up. Uh, like I said, I give it the old half turn, three quarter turn. If it stops, good to go. As long as there's not any play on the pinion itself. You shouldn't hear or feel any play. Shouldn't spin freely. That should be enough preload. Don't take my advice. I forgot to mention that. But anyways, it's good for me. It'll work for me. So the rest of this should be fairly simple. We're just placing the carrier back up there using the factory shims that we have on the same sides that they came out. We'll place it up there. We'll put the caps on. We'll check the backlash. If the backlash is good to go, we'll slap some paint on it and check the pattern. If that's all good to go, then we are good to go and we can slap the cover back on. I'm hoping we don't have to mess with the uh, backlash. Should be very similar. Uh, if that is the case, we have some shims and I'll walk you through that entire process as we go. All right, let me go dust off, throw some food down the throat, and we'll come back and we'll throw this carrier in there. All right, so I'm back. I got some food in my belly. Let's throw this thing up in here. 
Once we get it up here, then we can spray all this out and clean it off. Still need to clean all this junk off of here. That's no big deal. Throw this up here, get the shims up in place, and uh, throw the main bearing or the carrier caps on. So even with this thing up as high as I've got it, it's still difficult to do this on the ground. These carriers are in case they're heavy. So they go back on the same side you got it from. Beveled edge faces out towards the wheels. If it's got one, if it's the same on both sides, it doesn't matter. We'll throw it in here first and see what it looks like. And then we'll go from there as far as changing up backlash and everything else. So there we go. Bang some indents on here. The arrows face towards the axle, so we'll flip this over. And then the indents that I but, uh, banged in here, I put two dots. Two dots here, two vertical dots here, so I know I got the right side. We'll throw that in. And run it down with the impact. Looking for the arrows to face out towards the axle. And then I've got the two horizontal indents and two over here, so I know I got the right side. And we'll throw that on. All right, I'm gonna tighten these down with the impact. It's not gonna be like crank it all the way down to tight. I'm just tightening it down and cinching it down so there's no play um, and it's fully seated because we're testing for backlash right now. That backlash is determined by where this ring gear sits in relation to the pinion. So it would have less backlash the closer to the pinion, more backlash farther away from the opinion. And what I mean by backlash is that the teeth interconnect like this. There you go. And so the more they can move between each other, it's your backlash. And so they're shaped like triangles and the closer you get them together, the less backlash is. The more you get them apart, the more backlash there is. And so there is a specific uh, backlash for this axle that is preferred and I'll throw that up on the screen. But that's where we're trying to get it. So that's determined by how far to the driver's side or passenger side you move it. To the driver's side, more backlash. To the passenger side, less. So that's how it works. I'll show you the dial indicator here in a little bit as soon as I get this tightened up. How you know backlash is you're holding the pinion tight and the clicking back and forth is your backlash. And so we'll get a wrench and we'll put a magnet and a dial indicator and I'll show you. Might as well just do that right now. Jeez, some of y'all are too impatient. I'm trying to talk you through it. Okay, so I got the dial indicator hooked up, zeroed out. And what we're gonna do is we just rock the differential or the, the ring gear back and forth and watch the dial indicator. That should give us an idea. So preferred for this is between 12 and 15. Uh, that's the ideal. Um, it can be between 0 0.8 and 15, 0.08 and 15 thousandths. So we're going to see what we got here. So it is way too tight. Looks like about four thousandths, maybe three thousandths. It's hard to tell. Get a good. It's hard to look at you guys. Look at this through that and see what I'm looking at. So. Let me look at it from this angle, from your angle, and see what I got, and we'll go from there. All right, so we got about five thousandths, not enough. So what we're gonna do is since these are um, cast full, previously, previously determined um, shims, we can't make them smaller or bigger on one side without adding more and breaking down. So what we need to do is that it's too tight, meaning it's too far over to the uh, passenger side. We need to open it up. At least I would give it another five, six thousandths. It tends to be kind of like hard and getting it exactly. So in order to do that, we need to add five or six thousandths to the right side and take away five or six thousandths to the left side. That will maintain the proper preload and shift the differential to the driver's side, adding five to six thousandths to the backlash. That should be good. So what we'll do is we'll just add five to six thousandths to this shim. We don't have to break down the shim, but this one we can't take away from it. So we have to make up 
all of that up there. That's where the micrometer comes into play. We'll mic this one, see what it is, and then we'll take away five to six thousandths from that and build it with all the shims we have up on top. And then we'll just find a shim that's five to six thousandths and throw it in this right side. So that's the fun part. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so I pulled out the driver's side shim. We need to find out what the size is of this shim so we can make it up with all the ones that we have in there. That's where your digital caliper comes into play. So I zeroed it out. Let's see what we got. Looks like 27.4 thousandths. So we need to find something or put together something that is around 22 thousandths is what we'll call it. So these are all our shims that we have for either side. And uh, some of them are going to be different in uh, overall diameter. So you got to pay attention to that. So we're looking for is something near 22,000. So we'll take these two. They're all different sizes. There's a whole mix of different sizes in there. So we'll take these two, put them together, see what we get. So 19,000.2. Um, trying to find something that's sturdy because these really, really skinny. 1,000, 2,000 ones, they tend to bend and crimp when you put them in. So we're trying to find something that's on the sturdy end. 0.213, that's really close to what we were looking at. So I can throw one more thousandths in here maybe and just throw it between the two so it's not uh, gonna bend and we'll see what it looks like. Put them all together again. 0.225, we can deal with that. So that's only taking five thousandths off of the original one. I'd like to have a little bit more, so maybe we'll just take that thousands off and we'll call it 0.21 and we'll add uh, six thousands to the other side. That's what I'll do. So what I'm going to do, that'll get us closer to that 10,000, 11 thousands backlash, which is really close to the, the 12 and 15. So the, the reason I'm not diving way into it and taking seven off this side, adding seven to that side, because when you put it together, it tends to compress more and then you overshoot. So the chances of us getting between 12 and 15 with what we've got here is closer, uh, just from experience on how I've done it. So we'll start with this and we'll see where we're at down there. So this is the driver's side. We'll put the two big ones on either side so it doesn't crush. And then we are gonna try and find a shim that is 6,000 so we can put on the passenger side to move it over. 6.1, there we go, we'll go with that. So we got what we're gonna to add to the right side, got what we're gonna put in for the left side. That should shift us over enough to get us a, uh, a good backlash. And to tell you where we're gonna be at, we should be at 12, should, if just the math. But like I said, it tends to be a little bit more than what you're actually putting in. So let's go down and take a look, see if what we did fixed the problem. All right, we're at it on both sides now. We can sling this bad dog up in place. Oh yeah, that already sounds a lot better. We'll tighten it down, see where we're at. Honestly, I think it's gonna be high. I think it's gonna be 13, 14, somewhere around there. Maybe even close to 15. It's weird like that sometimes, just depending on how it goes with the shims. They give you one number, but then they kind of, with the, the surface between the two, I don't, I don't, I'm not an astrophysicist, I don't know how all this works. But anyways, that's just how it works sometimes. So let's see what we got with the backlash now. We can do this. So we are at 13. That's what I'm seeing is 13. Told you. I don't know why it's like that, but it is. It just is. So 13 is right in the ideal range. 12, 15 thousandths. We're at 13. Let's spray this out, throw some paint on it, see what our pattern looks like. And if it's good, we done. You heard? So what we have here, kind of like an oil paint comes with the uh, install kits we're just gonna slather this on drive and coast sides like four or five of them that way we can get a good idea of the pattern so the drive side of the gear going forward side of the gear that takes the most torque is the flat side the more flat side it's shaped kind of like a wave kind of like this this 
flat front side, that's the drive side, coast side's on the back, on the slope. Alright, we're going to hold some tension on the pinion and use a wrench to run the gear back and forth on the drive and coast with tension. And then that'll push a uh, pattern into this paint. So that pattern right in the center between the edges. It might be just ever so slightly too deep to actually, no, it looks, it looks good to me. I would run this all day long with no issues at all, but you can kind of see the pattern. It's right in the center, halfway down on the drive side, and then the coast side is the same thing. I'm happy with it. I'm gonna fill it up. So one thing you gotta know is that this is gonna break in. It needs to harden. And in order to break in, you gotta take it on like, I think the saying is 500 miles. Basically what you need to do is take it on the freeway, get it up to freeway speeds, run a load on it, 10, 15, 20 minutes or so, and then uh, run it back home, park it, let it completely cool down, and then you're heat treated. That's as much as I think it really needs. Some people wanna do 500 miles, like I said, but the oil is gonna get so, so hot, it is gonna break down. Don't go buy in 20, $30 Lucas for your break-in oil. Get the cheap stuff. Get the stuff that still has uh, dinosaurs in it and throw it in there and use it for your break-in. Drain it all out after your break-in, fill it up with the good stuff after that. It's ready to go. Let's get this all cleaned up, put back together, take it out on the road. filled it up with oil it's ready for a test drive however I'm gonna go get changed to take a shower because I am filthy and covered in oil and grease and sweat and everything else and I don't want to get it on my cowhide I don't have cowhide it's fine I'll see I don't want to get the interior messed up so I'm gonna get cleaned up and then we'll take it for a drive and sweat our little rounds off because it's 112 degrees outside right now but it'll be fun because we got a gear job done we did it in our own backyard with our own tools and I'm jinxing myself right now because I haven't listened to it to see if it whines or not. And it's not gonna whine, it's perfect. We did it perfect, so there's no worries. Okay, I'm gonna go shower. So, there is one thing that's been bugging me that I wanna take care of before we get out on the road. And it's this throttle linkage. So when you step on the throttle, it wants to, it's kind of a hard push and then it jumps forward. And I think it's this approach angle. I think we are too, far on the apex over here and too low down here. So I need to raise this up so it pulls more at this angle rather than hanging and uh, sticking the throttle. Ugh. I don't know how well that's gonna help, but maybe just a little upward pull is just enough. I don't know. We'll have to keep adjusting all this, see what works best. All right, I think we're ready. Get on the road and check it out. Those shims 
the depth on the pinion was a little bit concerning when I saw the pattern. It looked a little deep, but you don't hear any whining at all. So I'm really, really happy about that. I'm happy I can do 65, maybe even 70 without any issue. It's going to drink the gasoline, but I figured that's the way it was going to be anyways. But with the 410, it was going to be like 3,500, 3,600 RPM, which is way, way, way too much for this engine to be cruising at. Uh, I think it's just too much, too much spinning for 700 miles. But everything feels good, so we're going to keep cruising, breaking these gears properly. Once again, what a fantastic addition to this old truck. This thing is great. 355's good choice. 308's probably would have been a little bit better. But uh, I remembered about, I don't know, 10, 15 miles into that trip that the speedometer was going to be off. So I ran it on the GPS and it's about 10 miles an hour off. So we're actually way better than I thought we were. We're at about 2,800 RPM at uh, 70 mile an hour, which is fantastic. That is more than I could have hoped for and should be good enough for our trip. Um, hot Rod Power Tour and Run of the Pines, all that business. So glad you stuck around with me for this uh, backyard gear job. Also for all you heroes, that always stick around to the end of the uh, video. Let me see what all your merchandise looks like. All you guys that bought merchandise, tag me in some pictures of it or send me some pictures. I'll put it in my story. I want to see what all that stuff looks like. And I'm uh, very, very excited that you all uh, went out and purchased that stuff. So thank you again for all you that did. If you didn't go out and get the OG stuff, I got all the brand new stuff with brand new designs on VeteranRevivals.com. You can see it down in the YouTube uh, description as well and linked to this video. Make sure you guys go and you share my videos. That's one of the biggest things uh, that's struggling with the channel right now is that I'm not gaining any outreach. So if you could and you're willing to, go out and share my videos with all your buddies. Thank you guys. Thanks for watching. And as always, have fun. Just need the turbo now.